Hi, welcome to Dungeon Dives, where we're gonna do two things today. We're gonna get wet, and we're gonna get wild, as we delve into Serpent Shrine Caverns. Check down below for a specific part you might need, let's go. Before entering the Slippery Caverns, first you're going to need to get attuned. In order to do this, enter Heroic Slave Pens, there's gonna be a Naga with a quest standing right here. Now, go kill Gruul, go kill Nightbane. Return back to the Naga, now you are attuned. Congrats. Okay, now we're here in the instance. Welcome. The trash leading up to the first boss is pretty self-explanatory. Kill the hate screamers first because they do an AoE silence. Now let's fight the first boss, Hydros the Unstable. I cannot allow you to interfere. In order to kill Hydros, you're going to need two tanks. One of them is going to have to have 365 frost resistance, and the other should have 365 poison resistance. When you first engage Hydros, it will have these blue beams connected to it. That means it's currently in its frost phase. While in this phase, it will cast Water Tomb, which is an 8-yard AoE stun. The core concept of this fight is every 15 seconds, a debuff called Mark of Hydros will be put on every member of your raid, which increases the damage they take from frost attacks and stacks up to 6 times. It's recommended that every four stacks, aka every minute, you transition the boss into its poison form. To transition the boss, you're going to need to pull it over the imaginary line you see here that is marked with these flags. The water beams will disconnect from the boss and it will morph into its poison form, and water elemental adds will spawn whenever the boss crosses the line and switches forms. Attention! Every time Hydra switches forms, its aggro is reset. If your raid fails to let the tank establish aggro, it will be the number one reason why you die on this boss. Let's say one of your DPS does not slow down. That means that they're going to pull aggro on the boss. It will then cross the line again, summon more elementals, and very quickly the fight is going to turn into a cluster of nonsense. So when your raid leader says over and over again, Um, guys, can we please watch our aggro? They mean it. Pay attention. Anyways, in Hydros' poison form, it's much of the same, but it will have an ability called Vile Sludge, which deals damage and reduces healing by 50%. Again, after a minute, swap the boss back into its other form, rinse and repeat this over and over again until the boss is dead. You are the disease, not I. Congrats, I'm so proud of you. So now we're gonna go down here and face the next boss, which is optional, the Lurker Below. In order to summon this boss, you're gonna need 300 plus fishing and cast into the middle of the water. The Lurker Below has two phases. In phase one, the boss will stay stationary in the middle of the platform. The most important ability this boss has is Spout. He's going to blow water out of his mouth and rotate around in a circle. In order to dodge this attack, you're gonna need to jump into the water. Next he has Whirl, which affects players in melee range and knocks them back, and this is casted after Spout. He also has an ability called Geyser, which affects random players and knocks them back and any other player within a 10 yard radius. After 2 minutes, the Lurker will submerge in the water and you'll begin phase 2. During this phase, Coilfang Ambushers will spawn on the platforms and Coilfang Guardians will spawn in the middle. All of them can be CC'd, and it's highly recommended you do so. Focus down the Guardians first, and be careful melee, because they do have a cleave. After one minute, the boss will pop back out of the water, and right when he pops out, he's going to use Spout, so be very careful. Rinse and repeat, and the boss is dead. On the way to the next boss, we're going to need to clear a ton of trash. Your main priority should be the Greyheart Tidecallers, because they have some nasty spells, and it's very important everyone focuses down the totems that spawn water elementals. Greyheart Nether Mages really, really hurt, so either kill them or CC them. Coil Fathom Witches are going to do an AoE knockback, so don't fall off the platform and into the water. I should also mention you should be very aware of the Underbog Colossi that path around here because they have a ridiculously large aggro radius. When you get into the cave section here, there's going to be these Serpent Shrine Lurkers that spawn mushrooms that you don't want to stand in. In order to fight the next boss, you're going to need to kill the Greyheart Spellbinders, keeping him in place. Finally, my banishment ends. 
This boss has two forms, a human form and a demon form. Let's talk about the human form. He has one ability, and it's a whirlwind. It's gonna put a bleed on players that get hit by it. He also resets aggro after it's done. Yep, that, that's all he does in human form. After 45 seconds, he will swap into his demon form. In this form, he will keep casting Chaos Blast on his main target. It will deal AoE damage around the target and increases their fire damage taken. The most efficient way to deal with this is to have a demo spec Warlock with high fire resistance that just spams Searing Pain. You can also have a Warrior tank him during this phase, but they will need high fire resistance. The other ability he will cast in this phase is Inner Demon. Five raid members are going to have a little demon attached to them that only they can attack. Kill these little adds quickly or you will get mind control. At 15% health, the boss will split into two and you'll have to fight the demon and the human form at the same time. Just focus down the human form and the fight will be over. <laughs> Clear more trash and you'll quickly face the next boss. Guards, attention! We have visitors! This fight is very similar to High King Mulgar from Grohl's Lair. There's one main boss and three mini bosses. We need to kill the mini bosses before killing the main boss. I'm gonna go over the kill priority and explain their abilities in the process. The first ad we're gonna kill is Sharkus. Some people like killing Tidal this first, but I've seen it done both ways. Anyways, tank Sharkus right here. They have a multi shot, a mana burn on a random target, a spell that damages a random player, and he will summon a pet that is either a water elemental that explodes when it dies or a Spore Bat that does a knockback and reduces the tank's threat. Lastly, Sharkus will cast Beast Within, which increases his damage. After you kill Sharkus, the main boss will gain the Beast Within spell. Next on the kill priority is Tidalvis. He uses a bunch of Shaman spells that are not that important to go over. Just know that he's going to deal a lot of damage to your tank, and he's going to throw down a Spitfire Totem, which deals damage to five players within 45 yards, so it's very important you kill it as fast as possible. After this ad dies, the main boss will gain the Spitfire Totem ability. Lastly, we're going to kill the Priest. It's important you keep her far away from the rest of her friends, so she does not heal them. She also has a Water Bolt Volley, a 10-yard AoE stun, and she also summons a tornado that throws people up in the air. When she dies, the main boss will gain Tidal Surge, which is that 10-yard AoE stun ability. Now we can finally kill the main boss, which is pretty much a tank and spank. Just make sure that you kill the Spitfire Totem, and he will die. Her Excellency awaits! Move down the hallway and very quickly we'll face our next boss, Morogrim Tidewalker. This boss does AoE damage in front of him, which also reduces attack speed. So what we're going to do is we're going to tank the boss against this pillar and everyone in the raid will stack behind him. Throughout phase one, four players will get teleported to the middle of the room and be trapped in bubbles. A healer or two are going to need to run down and top these players up. Moral Grim will also cast Earthquake, which will do raid-wide damage and spawn two Murloc packs that come from both sides of the room. Simply group them up and AoE them down as fast as you can. At 25% health, Moral Grim will enter phase two which is more of the same, but instead of players being teleported to the middle of the room, the water orbs will start slowly traveling to players, and if they get hit by the orbs, they will deal massive damage. So what we're going to do is we're going to move the boss over here to the corner of the room so we can outrange these slowly traveling orbs. Other than that, the fight is pretty much the same. Great currents of Aegean. Water is life. It has become a rare commodity here in Outland, a commodity that we alone shall control. We are the Highborn, and the time has come at last for us to retake our rightful place in the world. Vash has three different phases. Her first phase is the simplest. She has a multi-shot, a stun on the tank that can be nullified if a shaman in their group has a grounding totem down, and an Entangle. But really the most important ability here is going to be Static Charge, which gets put on a random player and they just need to move away from everyone else. 
At 70% health, Vash is going to run into the middle of the room and won't take any damage. She will cast Forked Lightning in random directions in a cone in front of her all throughout the phase. During this phase, everyone in the raid is going to need to manage a multitude of adds, so let's talk about them one by one. Enchanted Elementals are very low health mobs that spawn all around the circular platform and they're going to move slowly towards Vash. If they reach her, they will increase her damage by 5%, so kill them before they reach the middle. Coilfang Elites are mobs you want your tanks to pick up and have them kept around the center of the room. They cleave and should be the main priority for the melee DPS in your raid. They spawn every 45 seconds. Coilfang Striders are where this fight gets interesting. If you are within 8 yards of this mob, you're going to get feared. So what you need to do is you're going to have a ranged player, like a shaman or a hunter, to kite the strider around in a circle until it dies. Have everyone in your raid cast dot spells on the striders to burn them down. One strider will spawn every 60 seconds. Lastly, and most importantly, Tainted Elementals will need to be quickly killed by players because they will despawn after 15 seconds. After the mob is dead, you'll need to loot an item off of its corpse called a Tainted Core. You need to take these Tainted Cores to the center of the room to deactivate the four shield generators around Vash. The catch is, you cannot move when you hold the core so you're going to need to pass it to another player. To give you a visual, here is a video from 2008 called Lady Vash, How to Pass the Fucking Core. God damn. So in this video, in its 360p glory, you can see that this player here passes it to the Tarn up here, who then passes it to a player standing next to the shield generator. I'm going to leave a macro in the description to make throwing them much easier. At the end of the day, the way to efficiently deal with this mechanic is really just great communication between you and your raid members. During phase 3, kill all of the adds from the previous phase. This final phase is very similar to phase 1, but spore bats will start to spawn and the rate at which they spawn will increase over time. When they die, they're going to leave some nasty AoE stuff on the ground you should not stand in. Random members of your raid are also going to get mind controlled. This ability she has was actually removed in patch 2.1 but it's in the PTR, so I guess expect to be mind controlled. If your tank can keep up with proper positioning, your healers can keep everyone topped up, and your DPS pumps, Lady Vash should be defeated. Lord Illidan, I... I am sorry. That is the end of the video. Thank you for watching. If you found this helpful, share it with a guildmate so they don't play like an idiot. Okay, bye.